Hello and welcome to the American Planning Association's National Capital Area Chapter 2021 Annual Conference. Um, my name is Nick Kushner. I'm an at-large member of the APA and CAAC Planning Board. Um, this session is being pre-recorded for the conference. Um, the title is Pivoting Planners, Virtual Engagement in a Pandemic. Um, our speakers today will be Odessa Phillip from Aceto Consulting, Joyce Seppis from AECOM, and then Sarah Benton from Prince George's County Planning Department. Um, this session is worth 0.25 CM credit, so you can claim that on the APA website. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah, who's going to kick off the presentation. Thanks, Nick. So again, welcome uh, to the session on, on pivoting planners, virtual engagement in a pandemic. I'm Sarah Benton, planner coordinator with Prince George's County Planning Department in the long range planning section of the community planning department and we're all part of the we're part of the maryland national capital park and planning commission i am also the project coordinator for the west Hyattsville queens chapel sector plan uh, we started on this sector plan about a little over a year ago um, this will be a 25 year uh, future forward looking long-term transit oriented development plan for the area around the west Hyattsville metro station uh, the area covers about 1,000 acres. Um, we have a population there, about 15,000 people, um, where 50%, about 50% of the population identifies as of Hispanic origin. And we also have about 10% of the population uh, is over the age of 65. So that's sort of the context uh, in which uh, we're going to be talking to you today about our experience with outreach during the pandemic. Uh, we spent the greater part of this past year on outreach and public engagement for the plan um, in this sort of emergency, weird public health emergency situation with all the restrictions on in-person activities. Um, so it's been interesting to try to pivot from in-person to virtual. Um, we want to talk to you a little bit about that today. So I am joined, by, uh, joined today by members from um, our consultant team, and I will let them introduce themselves. Uh, Odessa? Hi, my name is Odessa Phillip. I'm the president and CEO of Aceto Consulting. We're a planning and public engagement for, firm, and we're headquartered in Prince George's County, where the West Hyattsville Queens Chapel project took place. Joyce? Uh, my name is Joyce Sipas. Um, I'm AECOM's uh, urban planning uh, lead, uh, very passionate about the uh, topic of stakeholder engagement, and, and learned a lot uh, working alongside Sarah and Odessa. Thanks, Joyce. So when we talk about pivoting during the pandemic, and I know everyone's heard this word pivoting over and over again uh, during this past year, um, I am reminded of this Friends episode uh, where Ross, Chandler, and Rachel are trying to um, move a sofa up a stairwell. Um, Ross is really uh, excited. He's made this sketch, this plan for how they're going to do it. He's got it all figured out. Um, they're not going to have any issues. Um, so I'm just going to share a little clip with you. So as you can see, Chandler's really frustrated, like trying to pivot, constantly trying to uh, figure out how to make things work. And I think um, our team, and I'm sure many of you um, out there, have had a very stressful, frustrating experience over the past year and a half, trying to adapt and figure out what's going to work, what's not working, um, sometimes having to change plans at the last minute. Um, and it's been stressful. Uh, and I think you see that uh, in Chandler's reaction. I'm going to share one more little clip here. I can't believe that didn't work. I know, me neither. I mean, you had a sketch. <laughs> so, you know, we're planners. We like to have plans, but sometimes things don't always pan out. But I think, um, as Dwight D. Eisenhower once said, plans are worthless, but planning is everything. Uh, this was said in the context of emergencies, but more like in the terms of war. Um, we found this is also true for planning for outreach and public participation during this pandemic, right? Planning in a pandemic is subject to things not going the way we expect. Um, things have been ever in flux. 
but the planning process itself it has been really valuable since it allows us to really think about the different options we have and having contingency plans in place um, and really expecting the unexpected anticipating change um, we did write a public participation program as part of the sector plan that really laid out um, how we wanted to do outreach but we were able to um, include that uh, the virtual aspect of it and keep it um, use it as a guide um, going for going forward from the public participation program we knew we couldn't be rigid with that plan we had to be flexible and able to adapt uh, to change so that we could still meet the goals of outreach for this plan so Planning for change starts with an inventory of the tools in your toolbox. Um, we had to look at what traditional and non-traditional tools we had, um, both uh, across all of our teams and uh, organizations, and then thinking about how we could adapt those to our new virtual environment. Um, so since we had to pivot from in-person to entirely virtual, um, we tried as many tools as possible. Um, every different touch point we had with the public um, was unique. Um, we were trying to mirror the same robust in-person engagement we would normally have um, in this virtual environment, but this was really, I think it's important to talk about how this was an iterative process and a learning process. Um, we were trying different things um, at every turn. We tried some things that were more of a light lift, like uh, mailing out postcards to everyone in the plan area, uh, but including a QR code so they could you know, link up with our online materials. Um, we made a project video and put it on YouTube. Um, we did, you know, your traditional social media posts. We bought Facebook ads, but then we did, there was a lot of heavier lifts involving learning new platforms like Microsoft Teams, Teams Live, using Cisco WebEx for a, a focus group, using GoToMeeting, um, doing things pre-recorded versus live and all the prep that goes into that. Um, we used all these platforms for focus groups, stakeholder listening sessions, um, virtual workshops, we had office hours available to the public, um, but we also offered those via telephone, um, your more traditional method. Um, we, we learned to use new polling uh, and survey tools like Slido, Microsoft Forms, Conveo, Mural, um, and I'm going to touch on a few of those in just a moment because um, <clears throat> I want to highlight some of these tools that we really thought were very successful um, during this past year. I um, wanted to share those with you. So here we have an ArcGIS online interactive mapping tool. Um, this was really great. It allowed the public to uh, interact with this map and provide feedback about what they like, what they don't like, suggestions for improvements in space, in specific locations. Um, this was open for uh, just a couple of weeks and we got 286 comments. Um, we thought this was very successful and we got feedback from the public saying they really liked this tool. Um, we also used Mural. Um, Mural has both free and paid subscriptions. Um, Mural is an interactive workshop tool, I'd like to call it. Um, it allowed for the public to be in the same virtual space as us on this canvas, um, po put post-it notes, stickies, um, adding their comments. Uh, it has built-in survey and polling options so we could do visual preference surveys um, with participants. So this was really great, and I think we'll touch on this a little bit later, but it was interesting because um, as part of this, we sort of had to relearn how to use a post-it note. You know, everybody knows how to do that in, in, in person, but in the virtual environment, we actually had to kind of teach the public, like, this is how you put a post-it note on, on a board, um, which is something that would never happen in person. Um, so we'll touch on that a little bit later. Another tool was Conveo. Conveo allowed us um, to put documents out for public comment. Um, so we, we, after that visioning workshop where we used Mural, we were able to draft uh, a vision and goals and put them out there for the public to read through and add comments, suggesting different language, new language, new ideas. Um, so uh, this was really useful. Conveo also has other um, things you can do with it, like building surveys or doing a digital workshop as well. Um, so we really like that tool. Um, and it's pretty intuitive for building it out. Um, you don't necessarily need an IT person to do that. Um, an example of pivoting, uh, we tried to do an in-person event um, and then Delta happened. We had started collaborating with partners and coordinating and even sketching out just like Ross, sketching out like how we were gonna do this in-person event, showcasing some scenario planning that we'd been doing um, to really get the community out, 
and then Delta, the variant happened, right? Um, so we had to scale back and then quickly pivot and figure out how do we translate this to a virtual environment. And we ended up using this really nifty tool that AECOM um, has built out for us. We were already using this as part of um, the project um, and had put other information in this sort of 3D virtual reality room. Um, and we were able to quickly sort of switch that, retrofit it or update it with the material from the showcase we had wanted to do in person. And the cool thing about this was we were able to, the in-person would have been for a set couple of hours maybe or one day. This online showcase allowed us to have it out there um, for you know, several weeks. It's, actually, it's still up there. Uh, people can still look at those materials. Um, so this was a, a really great, and we've got a lot of great feedback on that as well. So we've learned an awful lot. Um, and I think it's important to note that not only our team has learned a lot, but um, the public has also learned a lot. We've also uh, taken time in our events, our outreach um, activities to train the public a bit on how to use some of these different plat platforms. So it's really interesting moving forward into whatever our future hybrid situation might be, um, is that we're more prepared and I think the public is somewhat more prepared as well in using some of these fit platforms and tools that we might see more of in the future. Um, so I'm gonna pass the mic to Odessa, who's gonna talk to us a little bit about some of the challenges we faced um, in using some of these new tools and in virtual engagement in general. Odessa. Thank you, Sarah. So the one thing that Sarah kept talking about was the stopping and taking a pivot moment. And we had that happen to us a lot. Uh, as we were looking through um, our ideas, uh, we talked, Sarah started with, we had an, a plan and the best laid plans, right? And so we had a complete engagement plan. Um, we started to change it early when we realized that we were going to be out for two weeks uh, that turned into a two-year um, time away. But as we were planning for it, we were looking for ways that whatever we did uh, we needed to make sure we considered the diversity of the audience. Um, Sarah talked about the demographics a little bit in the beginning. Um, and so understanding that those demographics were going to become a challenge for us, we spent a lot of time looking for ways that we would still reach the exact same people that we should have reached if we were in person. Um, so talking very specifically to start with the uh, Spanish speaking population and large immigrant population that exists or that lives in that project area, we realized how important it was uh, to figure out how do we overcome some of the challenges. Some of those challenges were everyone does not have a smartphone or that there is a large distrust of government and government processes, along with a very um, challenging political climate around immigrants and immigration. And so even though we talked about uh, doing this, these sessions, we needed to allow people to register as an example. But registration is a, is a word that is uncomfortable to a lot of people. So saying, oh, we're going to register you to attend an event was in a lot of ways a turn off to some communities. So we had to figure out how we were going to overcome that. Um, and then we had to start thinking through, okay, now if we can actually get people to participate in this session, uh, we've got to be able to speak to them in their native tongue. And so um, we actually offered sessions that were virtual for Spanish speakers only, and we offered sessions that were, um, uh, we offered all the materials translated as well, but then you still had to find a way for it to actually reach people. Um, just thinking about some of the challenges that we had, um, the pre-pandemic, when you had a public meeting, you didn't really practice, right? Uh, we would go to a, a particular site and make sure it was ADA compliant, um, that people could physically get into the space, um, that there were no stairs or things that we needed to navigate and we'd make sure that like the electrical outlets were working. But when you start thinking about like mural or conveyo, you're saying to yourself, how do we uh, make sure we reach everyone? So we're gonna do this session on mural. Oh wait, we're already in Zoom. So what if a person doesn't have two devices? And that was not something we would have ever thought about in the past, but that was something we had to realize. And so we would do a dry run. But Sarah and Joyce can tell you, we would do these dry runs and the hilarious thing would be the one person who would say, oh, I decided to do this from my iPad and not my computer. Um, yeah, that's always a scary moment because every time we did a dry run, what we would find is 
oh, it worked perfectly on a Windows computer, but it didn't work on a Mac. Or it would work on an Android device, but not an Apple device. We needed to do something else. Um, so we would try making sure there's a call-in number. Oh, but with the call-in number, you can't mute people anymore, right? So we found ourselves doing lots and lots of dry runs. Um, and ultimately, oh my gosh, people were so frustrated. You're using all this technology. And Sarah talked a little bit about like teaching people how to use a post-it note, which to us now seems so uh, transparent. But I said to Sarah that one thing I learned from the commission as a client was teach people how to use it. Don't just uh, do it as a training, but let's think about all of people's learning styles. So we would put a slide in every presentation that says, this is how you use platform X. And this is how you do these steps. So there was a visual cue as well as a verbal cue on how to do things. Um, and that helped. Um, but then people got tired of Zoom or insert platform here. We're doing this session now as a pre-recorded session, um, but it's hard because people are really looking forward to getting over it. Um, but there's the other side to this, which is that we learned a lot of things that we can use again in the future. Uh, we, while registration could create some challenges, we also found we were better prepared if we knew there were going to be 75 to 100 to 120 people in a session because then we would have enough facilitators and we could do breakout rooms. So if you think about what happens in a real public meeting, you say, okay, we'll put 10 people over at this board so you can have a nice, uh, robust conversation. Well, if you don't know if you're going to have 50 or 250 people showing up, you don't have enough facilitators. So we learned that, right? Remember that, Sarah, when we had like every, every facilitator we could think of was actually present. Um, and then we didn't need all of them, but we were prepared for it because we had done planning on top of planning, on top of planning. So we took planners and made them planners on steroids in order to make sure everybody knew how to use every part of the tool. I think the last thing we learned was around social media. Um, a lot of people are excited about social media. The cost is right. Um, it doesn't cost a lot. But then when you start thinking about the challenges of social media, it costs more than you expect. Because if a uh, particular customer doesn't have enough followers or a project doesn't have followers, you can only spread the word with the people who are already involved in that progress. So the last piece we learned, and we learned this as a company that does engagement a lot, is that the projects that allowed us to have a specific project-related social media, we had far more success than if we only relied on the agency. And that was just because the agency has to make sure people are engaged in all of their projects and they don't have the time to dedicate to one particular project. So that was kind of our big lesson learned um, as it related to social media. And so we'll just keep pushing forward with that in the future, but we will keep using social media. <laughs> Joyce. Thanks. So uh, many hurdles, uh, as we mentioned, um, but we also feel like there were many success stories. Um, you know, the first is virtual engagement it can actually allow for more one-on-one -on -one conversations. Uh, Sarah mentioned phone calls. It can get us thinking about, maybe I don't need to meet people in person, but I can talk to every property owner, every business owner in a phone call or a one-on-one -on -one, uh, Zoom or, or Teams meeting. Um, and it also helped us think about how to engage uh, more creatively um, and more thoughtfully. Um, you'd think that because we were virtual, people may have perceived that we were hiding, but I can't tell you how many people actually came up to us and said, hey, I recognize you from our Teams meeting. I appreciate all the effort that you put into it. So um, with Odessa talking about some of the challenges of being labor intensive, I think the public actually saw us as being visible because they knew how much we were trying and, and supporting one another in the effort. Um, you Sarah talked about pooling resources together. We did that early on. We sort of did a call to like every tool that uh, the commission, Odessa's team, our team was using, and we tried to test and see which ones were going to be the right fit for this. We felt like not throwing every tool at this and kind of honing in on the ones that mattered most or we felt like were going to be the most successful, have the highest impact, are the ones that we tried to kind of stick with. Um, 
Odessa mentioned, Sarah mentioned, kind of giving space to Spanish speaking audience. Uh, Ziz will uh, just show some of our material, everything that we put out there in the public, uh, we translated um, into Spanish, uh, our presentations. Uh, this is the small touches, right? So instead of having kind of translation as a small cliff note at the bottom of a PowerPoint slide, uh, we embedded uh, translation on every slide. So sometimes it's just those touches. And, and during our fo focus groups, we actually had people say that we really appreciated that you took the time uh, to, to orient your slides in, in both uh, languages. Um, the next, I think, Sarah, if you could go to the next slide. Um, it's so, you know, we saw the image of our, our virtual room. I think a lot of us are, are using these virtual room platforms. Um, but they're only so good as people know that they exist. Uh, they might look interesting. And so something, we had an aha moment, maybe a little later in the game, but sometimes those aha moments happen uh, five to six months in. Uh, Odessa was like, we've got to get QR codes out um, in the community. And so it's really interesting. After we did that, and, and Sarah shared the stats with us this morning, you can see that 50% of the